All right, everybody. We are live, uh, just about one minute ahead of schedule, so I'm going to wait just a second uh, to see if folks hop on for this, which is session three of uh, our study on the Gospel of John, um, based on this book by Adam Hamilton um, and accompanying video and study guide and the whole thing. It's like a whole package, but this book, uh, John, the Gospel of Light and Life, is what this study is based on. Um, in week one, we talked about the ways that the Gospel of John was different from the other three Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, and then last week, we talked about the seven signs of Jesus. And this week, we're going to talk about the, uh, the seven I am sayings that Jesus makes throughout the Gospel of John um, and how they illuminate certain parts of God's character and what they tell us about who Jesus is and what Jesus is here to do. So, um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, before we get started, though, I want to uh, apologize for something last week. I, I put this in the comments of last week's video, um, but I, I wanted to begin today by acknowledging that I misspoke as I was trying to cram everything in last week and fit Nicodemus in uh, with the seven signs of Jesus. As I love Nicodemus. I think he's such a fascinating character to think about uh, in, in the Gospel. And he only appears in the Gospel of John. So I wanted to mention him last week. But uh, in going through my notes so quickly, I misspoke and said that uh, Nicodemus appeared in three places, which he does. He appears in John chapter 3, John chapter 7, and then later at the tomb of Jesus. But last uh, week I misspoke and said that he appeared in John chapter 9 instead of John chapter 7 because we were talking about John chapter 9, and John chapter 9 features the Pharisees, and Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Anyway, but, but Nicodemus is in John chapter 7, not 9, so I apologize for that. My notes uh, last week were correct, but I just was scrolling through so quickly and I messed that up, so I didn't. Uh, unaddressed. So, all right, let me pull up my notes for this week, and we will jump in and get started. As I said, you can download uh, my outline and notes for this session uh, on my personal website, the link of which will be in the description to this video, and I'll also post it in the comments. Uh, that will have everything and more uh, that I'll talk about today, as well as a few questions for reflection uh, at the end of that. So I encourage you all to go on and download those um, once we're done for today. Or honestly, you can even go and download it now and follow along uh, if you want to, because I actually posted them before the video uh, today. I, I was a little, got ahead of myself. So they're up there now if you want to go and download those. So, all right, so let's jump in. Uh, the, the seven I am sayings of Jesus, okay? That's what uh, today is about. Um, again, a reminder, John is different than the Synoptic Gospels, and we remember Synoptic means with one eye, and the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's different than those Gospels. Um, John, as we talked about before, doesn't have parables. Uh, it's deeply theological in nature. Um, John has a highly defined structure, so you've got prologue, section one, section two, and epilogue. And, and John is all, again, all about structure. So you had seven, uh, you know, seven um, signs. And today we have seven I am sayings. There's John, John is really good about parallelism, all that. So last week we talked about those seven signs that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John. Because again, there's no parables, but these signs kind of function a little bit like parables uh, for us. They invite exploration. And we'll talk about today the ways in which the... Um, the I am sayings kind of work this this way as well. So anyway, those seven signs are Jesus changing water into wine, Jesus healing the royal official son in John 4, John healing the paralytic at Bethesda in John 5, uh, John feeding the 5,000 in John 6, Jesus walking on water in John 6, Jesus healing the man born blind in John 9, which we talked a lot about last time, uh, and the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Now, last time I talked about how scholars kind of debate about some of these. Um, they argue that some of these signs are combined into one sign. And anyway, you can read all about that in my notes. Um, there isn't that amb ambiguity, though, about the seven I am sayings. Scholars don't debate about those because 
I mean, they're pretty easy to spot, okay? And so uh, there isn't some debate about it, where one begins and one ends and all that kind of thing. But last week, there was some debate about that, uh, and so you can find that in the notes. But those were the seven signs of Jesus. Um, so the seven I am statements sometimes, uh, oftentimes actually, take place in the context of one of these seven signs, as we will see when we explore uh, one of those signs in depth, or sorry, one of those I am sayings in depth today. Um, so before we talk about uh, the what those seven I am statements are, uh, we need to talk about I am itself. Like, why is that important? And, and why are these statements so uh, revolutionary and so crucial to John's Christology? Which, as we remember from an earlier se section, Christology just means um, our, our theology of the Christ, our, you know, our ideas about that. Um, so in order to, to understand the significance of the I am statements, we first have to go all the way back to the book of Exodus, okay, uh, to a story that all of us probably know very well, and that is the story of Moses and the burning bush uh, from Exodus chapter 3. Okay, so in Exodus chapter 3, uh, Moses is tending uh, some flocks of sheep in the Sinai desert and when he notices there's a bush burning out in the wilderness. And he notices something really curious about this bush, that even though it's on fire, the flames don't consume the bush. And so he approaches this bush to investigate, and then something even more curious happens than that, which is the bush starts to talk to him. It says his name, right? Which would, I mean, that would kind of freak me out, right? So Moses approaches the bush, uh, and the voice uh, essentially just tells Moses that the cry of Israel has been heard, um, and that Moses is the one that will lead the Israelites out of captivity. Remember, they are um, in captivity in Egypt. They've been enslaved by the Egyptians for a long, long time, and Moses is the one who's going to lead them out of captivity. So Moses is stunned, um, and uh, we have to remember here, too, that Moses grew up in a polytheistic world. Moses grew up around the Egyptians. The Egyptians had many gods, and so uh, Moses knows that he needs more information from this talking bush. He's, he needs to know which god in particular he's speaking to. And so Moses asked the bush in verse 13, he says, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I, what shall I say to them? And God responds through the bush. God responds, I am who I am. Yahweh, okay? I am who I am. The divine name, also known as the Tetragrammaton, which is a super cool sounding word that I put in my notes if you want to read it. Um, so that's I am, right? That's what God says. I am. You should tell them I am. Uh, and so um, so we have to begin there, okay? And there are a number of ways in which the story of Moses gets uh, recast into the life and ministry of Jesus, okay? And we'll say more about that below when we talk about the I am statements, but there are there's a way in which Jesus is symbolically read as a kind of new Moses, okay, who's coming to um, free all of humanity from the bondage of sin and death, just like Moses freed the Israelites from the, you know, bondage of, of slavery in Egypt. Um, and so we're being freed from the bondage of sin and death by Jesus. Uh, and think about, too, what happens on the Mount of Transfiguration, um, you know, when that Peter and uh, James and John, they see Jesus transfigured and is like go bright light and uh, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. Okay, so Jesus had this association with Moses and there's a lot that can be said about that, but that's for a different time. Um, all you need to know is that when God tells Moses what his name is, God tells Moses that his name is I Am. Okay, and that's that's really, really important. Um, now, it's so important, actually, that many Jews, um, in a practice that dates centuries even before the time of, of Jesus, um, Jews d largely don't speak that divine name. They do not say um, the name of God, uh, nor do they write it. So some of you may have seen um, uh, some of your Jewish friends, um, when they write God, they'll put a G and then a dash and then a D, okay? Uh, and that's kind of been the same thing. 
uh, and they do that because of the the sanctity of the holy name. They 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 believe that it is holy and sacred. So you know uh, they also um, there's also the sense that uh, God is infinite, and to name God is to limit God. I am who I am is like just being itself. And so anyway, cool stuff. You could we could do a whole se se uh, session on that by itself. But again, we got to move on because I'm mindful of time here. Um, so all that to say. That name, I am, is first of all God's name, and second of all, it is extremely holy in um, the Jewish tradition. Okay, so these sayings, the seven I am sayings, have an incredible amount of significance for those who are listening to Jesus, just as they have for us reading the Gospel of John today, because they are not just um, they're not just descriptions <laughs> uh, of Jesus's personality or something. They are divine ascriptions, right? They are uh, ascriptions of a divine nature that ascribe qualities to the character of God. I mean, this is really, it's, it's big, it's big stuff, okay? So what are those seven I am sayings? Now, in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to himself as I am on a number of occasions, more than just seven, actually. Uh, perhaps the most notable episode where he does this comes in John chapter 8, uh, where he's speaking to the Jewish leaders and he claims, Jesus claims, that before Abraham was, I am, okay? And the leaders uh, immediately take up uh, rocks to stone Jesus because that was the punishment for blasphemy was stoning. Um, and Jesus had basically called himself God, right? Like before Abraham existed, I am. Well, the Jewish leaders are like, you know, obviously they, they as, the, as the youth say, they were shook. Um, by this. And so uh, anyway, so Jesus does invoke the divine name more than just seven times, but there are um, seven times that Jesus attaches an attribute to the divine name. And those are what we're talking about today. So um, those seven statements are, and, and these should all be pretty familiar, actually. We talk a lot about them in the life of the church. So those seven statements are, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. I am the light of the world in John chapter 8. I am the gate for the sheep in John uh, chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, which comes immediately after um, that previous one. I'm the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd are two verses apart. They're right next to each other in John chapter 10. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11. Uh, that's in the raising of Lazarus, uh, which we read from this past Sunday. Uh, and then I am the way, the truth, and the life from John chapter 14. And the final one is I am the true vine, which is found in John chapter 15, okay? So we don't have time to go through each one of those, which is part of your homework assignment uh, for next week. But I did want to look uh, at one of these um, statements and look at it in depth. So we're going to look at the first of those statements, I am the bread of life. Uh, we're going to look at that one today. In my notes, I also have some notes on um, I am the light of the world, uh, but I just focus on those two, mostly because those are the two that actually Adam Hamilton talks about in his book that I'm basing the study on. So anyway, um, so I am the bread of life in John chapter six. Let's talk a little bit about this. So this is Jesus's first I am statement. Um, uh, again, not the only time that he says I am, but this is the first time that he says I am and then puts an attribute to it. Um, it comes in the midst of the uh, of one of the signs, actually. Uh, like I mentioned before, this comes during the feeding of the multitudes, so that's the context for him saying this. I am the bread of life comes right after he has just fed a whole bunch of people, um, impossibly, it's seeming, right, from just some loaves, pardon me, loaves and fishes. And so this is when he says, I am the bread of life, is after this. Um, John also is careful to tell us at the beginning of John chapter 6 that this story is happening near the day of Passover, okay? So this is also part of the context for this uh, saying. Uh, and we need to remember that Passover is the feast that celebrates God deliver God's deliverance of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So again, this... It, already has to do with Moses again, right? Uh, we get that association with Moses because Passover um, is part of the observance of that story uh, as well. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Um, Passover is, of course, celebrated with a meal, uh, and it is a meal that would begin to take on a new meaning in tr Christian tradition 
uh, as the Last Supper, right, as the Eucharist. And so that's part of the, the context here. Now, before we go any further, I want to remind y'all, like last week when I talked about how the seven signs um, operate a little bit like parables in the sense that they invite exploration, they... Um, we're supposed to look at the, the, the symbolism of them and peel back the layers of, of, of the symbolism that's there. Um, and th that's, that's, I think, what John wants us to do, because John is a very devotional gospel. It's meant to inspire belief, right? So John, uh, want, I, I think, wants us to do that and is intentionally mentioning certain things in order to, um, you know, to trigger our brains and, and those associations with different parts uh, of the scriptures and the biblical story. Well, that's a lot of what we're also seeing here with the I am statements, okay? So already I talked about how John's mentioned this is near Passover. The context is when Jesus has multiplied loaves and fishes. So there's already this, um, this Eucharistic imagery that John is, is, is putting in here um, that we're supposed to see. But there's, there's more uh, as well. So not only do we see a profound Eucharistic connection in this story with Jesus saying that I am the bread of life, and we think, um, so in the Gospel of John, one of the things that's different about it from the synoptics is there isn't an institution, the words of institution, like that you find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus says, this is my body, you know, the bread is, anyway, or, or takes the wine and says, my blood. Um, but, uh, but here, actually, we're kind of getting it, because Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. Uh, it's, it's just John is putting this in a different context for us, and again, saying something a little different theologically there. So uh, I've talked about the the Eucharistic connection there with Passover, but there's more even um, there's more Eucharistic resonance there because uh, we also think of Jesus as the Passover Lamb, right? We say as part of the Eucharistic prayer, "Christ, our Passover was sacrificed for us; therefore, let us keep the feast." Right? So even in our usual worship on Sundays, that's you know this is part of what we we recall and what we're thinking about. There's also a connection here, um, and this is another um, mosaic association, another association with Moses. There's a connection here with the idea of manna, you know, the bread that came down from heaven, um, which then brings up this association with our dependence on God. So if Jesus is the bread of life, you know, that he's that there's that association with our dependence on God and God providing what we need. Um, uh, there is, um, oh, okay, I already said that, actually. I got ahead of myself uh, in my notes um, about how there is then the symbolism of Jesus as a new Moses that delivers humanity from slavery to sin and death, or from sin and death. Uh, we said that earlier. Um, the other thing, too, that I think we're supposed to think about here a little bit, and this was something that Adam Hamilton brought up. Again, I'm just going to to appease copyright gods. I don't know. Um uh, that bread then, as now, um, we use as an association of money and, and financial sustenance, right? Um, and so there, uh, there's this sense in which if Jesus is the bread of life, um, Jesus doesn't just provide us with this kind of spiritual nourishment and whatever, but also um, Jesus is it's sort of like the living water, right? Um, it, Jesus is the true sustenance that we should focus our attentions on and not be focused on that kind of, <laughs> like that fina the, the financial bread um, that we're trying to, uh, to win. And so, um, so that's kind of the way uh, that, that you might look at some of these I am statements, is to think about the ways that they, um, the, the different kinds of symbolism that you might see uh, in them, Ask yourself, you know, what is uh, what what sort of things does this tell me about the character and nature of God? Um, what sort of other Bible stories does this make me think of? Does this bring to mind? Uh, you might think about um, uh, the context, right, that these statements are coming in. What has Jesus been doing? What has he just been talking about? How does that maybe um, change and affect the meaning of these statements for us? Um, so that's that's kind of an approach, I think, that is helpful as you're reading through the Gospel of John and you come across these statements, uh, a way to read them and, and think about them. So that is the, the uh, I am the bread of life. There are six other I am statements um, that we're not going to be able to get to today that we talked about earlier. Um, 
And so that's where we're going to have to leave it for today. But I hope that I've given you at least a little bit, uh, uh, a, a few tools to use as you continue in your reading of the Gospel of John. Um, in my notes, like I said, I talk a little bit about I am the light of the world and, and what that means and, and give a little bit of context about that. Uh, but I invite you in the questions for reflection uh, in preparation for next week to look at the other six statements and to think about, again, think about their context, think about what each divine ascription says about the nature and character of God, write down those observations, use them to help guide your prayer uh, as, as you're reading through the gospel, the gospel of John. And uh, finally, um, next week, uh, which I think is, is actually really perfect because next week is Holy Week, uh, we will already be turning our attention to what's called the farewell discourse in the Gospel of John, where um, Jesus talks about his, uh, his death and um, eventual resurrection and, and all of that. So we're already turning our attentions next Wednesday to the Passion, uh, which I think is very fitting and very good. So, um, so anyway, it was good to be with y'all today. I hope that was helpful. I hope y'all got something out of that. And um, like I said, if you leave any comments or questions rather in the comments, I will do my best to get to those and answer them. Uh, and then if you go to the link that I put in the video description, uh, it'll take you to my website. You can download the notes. And uh, I look forward to seeing y'all the same time next uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, as we begin our uh, next exploration in the Gospel of John with the farewell discourses and begin to look towards the cross. So blessings, everybody. Thanks for joining, and I look forward to next week.